Welcome to Physician Focus. I'm Dr. Dale McGee. Medicine has seen a rapid advance of technology affecting both physicians and patients. The adoption of electronic medical records has been swift with some 90% of physicians in Massachusetts now using some form of electronic medical record. While this technology offers great promise to improve care with better outcomes, the road to electronic medical records for physicians has been rocky and the reception by patients seems mixed with concerns about physician attention and patient confidentiality. This edition of Physician Focus will examine the effects of electronic medical records on both physicians and patients. Do they help or hinder the physician? Should patients be concerned about privacy and about who has access to their confidential medical records? What are the advantages and disadvantages of these tools for both physicians and patients? Our guests for this discussion are Dr. Joseph Heyman and Dr. Glenn Tucker. Dr. Heyman is a former president of the Massachusetts Medical Society and former chairman of the board of the American Medical Association. For 41 years, he practiced obstetrics and gynecology in Newburyport and was an early adopter of electronic medical records. He is currently a member of the Society's Committee on Information Technology and is chief medical information officer of Wellport Health Information Exchange in Newburyport. This is a computer system allowing physicians in different networks to communicate with one another and securely share patient information. Dr. Tucker is a practicing primary care physician and is chair of the Massachusetts Medical Society's Committee on Information Technology. He is also chief of internal medicine and chief medical information officer at Sturdy Memorial Hospital in Attleboro. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Let's start with something very simple. What is an electronic medical record? What makes it different than paper? Uh, I think the main thing that makes it different than paper is it's not simply uh, a list of documents uh, pertaining to a particular uh, patient. The, the information in there is divided up into various types, like there's uh, the laboratory reports, but then there's also specific um, results there, uh, like the sodium levels and things like that that are um, stored independently of the rest of the data in there. And so it's, um, while you, we do have lists of documents, there's also this uh, database of individual uh, items. Mm -hmm. I think um, one way of describing them is the advantages that they uh, give to physicians. For example, uh, when you have things on paper, um, you have to be able to find them, and you have to be able to store them. So you need a lot of space for storage, and then you need a system where you can find them, and if you're in a practice that has more than one office, it's not unusual for the chart not to be available at the particular office where you are stationed. So in that sense, even if they were identical with paper, uh, as far as what their contents were concerned, they offer those two really very, very substantial advantages. Another thing about them is that they can be used for more than just keeping records for the patient. Um, and I'm not sure whether that's an advantage or a disadvantage. It would be an advantage if it didn't interfere with the <laughs> record keeping. However, uh, sometimes it does, and I'm sure we'll get into that discussion. But um, it, it provides a, a database that can be used to measure quality, to do research, to um, provide um, information about uh, the patient population that the physician is taking care of. There are a lot of uh, peripheral things that it can do um, if it's used properly uh, that you would not be able to do on paper easily. So, for example, if, if there was a drug recall and a doctor wanted to say, geez, how many of my patients have this drug? How can I reach out to them? If they had a paper record, they would have to go through every chart and hope that it was written down and they found it. Exactly. Except with an electronic yes. record, they can just design a report and d develop a list and, and send out a letter in a, a matter of minutes. That's exactly yes. right. Exactly. So yes. it's that ability to look things up and to find information about not only one patient but your whole population that, mm -hmm. that it brings to the party. And then you, you bring up another interesting point, and that is it, it's not unusual as a physician to have a patient come in and nobody can find their record. They're rifling through it, somebody was filing it someplace, and, and it, it got misplaced. With an electronic record, not so much. 
You can well you can almost do never is it. Yeah. You right. can almost always. I can't think of a situation in which I wasn't able to find a patient's record. Right. And and virtually every electronic medical record system that's out there gets backed up. Right. Yes. So if the place burns down. Exactly. You've got it. Yeah. Frequently, what happens also now is that there's a. a a, a live um, version that's running and that I'm working with on a day-to-day -day basis, but then there's also a backup that's um, that can be accessed at a completely different um, yeah. methods in, in case uh, uh, one the, the, the live version blows up for whatever reason. Right. That there's another way to get at the information. Right. Wonderful. So both of you have been involved with electronic records for a long time before the mandates from the government and everything else. Early on in the technology, how did you how did you get involved? Well, when I first started practice um, here in Massachusetts in uh, 2000 or 2001, um, it was in a paper-based chart. And uh, eventually, um, when I left that group and I did hospitalist work, and then I was going back into office-based practice, this was about the time when people were starting to make the transition to electronic records. And one of the things I decided at that time was that I wanted to go to a place that had an already functioning um, record. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that was my um, uh, transition to it. Um, uh, the reason that I wanted to go to a place that already had it functioning was that um, I'd heard um, and read awful stories about people making the transition from a paper chart to an electronic one, and I decided I wanted to avoid all of that um, headache right. <laughs> for this next step in my career. So, right, right, yeah. nice. And Joe, you've been at this a long time. Yeah, so um, I was in a, um, an obstetrics and gynecology group that was relatively large. Uh, I started practicing in 1973. And in the very late 70s and the early 80s, we were uh, the first group actually in our area to do electronic billing and electronic scheduling. And I always wanted to have an electronic medical record because there were, by the time uh, I left that group, which was in 2001, uh, we had nine physicians, um, some nurse practitioners, uh, several offices. Charts were getting lost. Charts were uh, difficult to find. And it would have been fantastic uh, to have an EMR at that time. But I was leaving in 2001, and I was moving out on my own. And um, I needed to rent office space and find people to work for me. And it occurred to me that it would be a lot easier and a lot cheaper for me if I didn't have to have a bunch of people taking care of paper records. So I went online and I did a lot of research and I ended up buying an electronic medical record. Actually, when you get them, you're not really buying them, you're licensing them. But in any event, I did it online with a credit card, and I used that electronic medical record from 2001 until 2014 when I retired. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a lifesaver for me. Uh, you know, it made my practice possible. I only need to have one employee. I didn't need a lot of space, except in the very beginning, uh, when patients asked to have their records sent to me so that I could continue taking care of them. I had a desk that was a little larger than this one. Actually, it was a counter that went across the room. And we just piled all the uh, charts that came in on, you know, that were copied mm -hmm. onto this desk and tried to put them in alphabetical order so that when the patients came in, um, we would scan the patient's old chart into the record on the day they came mm -hmm. and then start a new electronic medical record for them on that day. So that, that's how I started. So you, you both point out something very critical here, and that is that transition from paper to electronic isn't easy. And there may be a science to it. There may be a lot of points to finesse that a lot of people getting into this for the first time don't fully appreciate until they're in over their heads. Can you give us a, a few ideas about the implementation piece of electronic records? How, how does it change a practice? How does an office have to prepare for this sort of thing? What kind of problems have you either experienced or heard about? Um, 
I, I think, it, well, in my case, I, um, I had a lot of experience like uh, Joe did, where people were coming in and they would bring or send their uh, paper records um, to me. Uh, but I also, as I said, I, I started in a group that already had implemented um, an electronic record. So for a, a good number of the patients, I didn't have to um, uh, make that transition. The, the thing that was challenging was at first, you know, thinking that this whole entire, you know, two or three inch stack of paper needs to be scanned into the chart. And I said, and I said, um, no, that's all of this information here is not exactly. helpful or critical in any way. And so I finally, you know, got smart and said, you know, to my staff, here's what I need. I need the last, you know, any pathology reports, any colonoscopies, any of, you know, the last physical that they did. You know, lab reports from seven years ago um, are just not helpful mm -hmm. at all. It's, it's wasted um, space at this point now. What did you run into, Joe? So I was by myself and had only one employee who was a medical assistant. So I went through the charts myself on the first initial visit with the patient. And I would just glean from the chart what I thought was really important. And I felt like, you know, I wasn't responsible for saving those charts anyway. It was the other practice that mm -hmm. was responsible for keeping those medical records. So. Um, I did the same thing. I tried to minimize the amount of space I needed. But um, I will tell you that in the very beginning, I left a lot of time for each patient. I would mm -hmm. say there was at least a two-month period when I first started the practice uh, where I had an hour for each patient because I had to learn the system and I had nobody to teach me how to do it. Mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, I was fortunate in my retirement because because I was the solo practitioner and I was my own boss, I could allot a half hour to every patient. Mm -hmm. So in doing that, uh, I learned to use the electronic medical records so that it, you know, it became second nature to me and it was very quick and I could spend a lot of time with the patient themselves. However, in 2002, I think it was 2002, I had somebody helping me uh, set up my network. And um, at the time, I uh, had just been elected to the board of the American Medical Association. And this guy was a hospital employee. And he set up the network, and he showed me how to back it up every day. So I was backing up my system every day. And at that time, um, I forget the name of the program I was installing, but it was in a program so that you could use the, um, you could use the medical records from home. Mm -hmm. And I installed an update in that program. And then when I turned the computer back on, I could see all the records, um, but I could only see them on one place in the office and no place else. Mm -hmm. And I got very nervous about it, and I called this guy, and he said, oh, well, there's nothing to worry about because you backed it all up. Just turn it all off, and go mm -hmm. home, and I'll, I'll come in. So he came in at midnight, and at 4 o'clock in the morning, I got a call from him saying that uh, we had lost everything. Mm -hmm. This was a year's worth of medical records on patients. I could tell there was a horror story <laughs> <laughs> coming up. And, um, I'll make it short because obviously we have very limited time. So uh, basically what I did was um, I was fortunate that the very next day um, a person who was a patient of mine knew of a place that recovers these kinds of things from drives. Mm -hmm. And I sent it into them, sent the drive into them, actually sent a record into them, um, a uh, a tape. Mm -hmm. uh, they told me how to produce it and I sent it to them and they called me up and told me that they could not extract anything from it now but they were developing a new program for extracting information and I said just get me my clinical information back I don't care how you do it. So 
you got it done. I got it done. It took Good. six weeks. Yep. And it was only the clinical information, the billing information was lost. Oh boy. So this, this makes a critical point, and that is that the typical physician is not trained in information technology. Exactly. No. And, and I'm also uh, later on going to say the typical physician isn't trained in workflow analysis or anything like that. We're trained to understand patients, diseases, treatments, things like that. And the usual staff, the, the schools that they go to to uh, help us in our offices, don't train them in these, these fields at all. So this whole issue of how to implement information technology in a medical office requires a skill set that is, does not exist in the office prior to the introduction of this technology. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the experiences we have had is that in, in bringing people into the office to help us with this new technology, often we're bringing people in who are not familiar with medicine. And so it is that awkward dance that is leading to much of the frustration that we have uh, heard about from physicians and from patients who are saying this record, you know, this program doesn't understand me or this, this program's hard to use or it's taking up too much time or whatever. It is, it is that dance that, that seems to be uh, part of our problem. Is that a fair assessment? It yes. is a fair assessment, yes. but I think nowadays it's a lot easier to find uh, organizations, companies that mm -hmm. actually are familiar with taking care of uh, medical mm -hmm. records. Mm -hmm. the, from the IT side and making certain that the kind of horror story I just described, which is the early part of my you know, medical record career, uh, doesn't occur. And as a matter of fact, the point I was making about being on the AMA board was I had this horrible picture in my mind of the newspaper headlines saying, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Heyman, AMA board member, loses license because of losing <laughs> patient records. Patient records. Yeah, it doesn't look good. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the fact is, is we're introducing this technology because it can do things we can't do now. Right. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, one thing that's um, uh, interesting about this is that an electronic medical record, what, what we need, the functions that it needs to do to be helpful to a physician and to the patients uh, for their for the patient's benefit, which is the whole point of everything, is very different than what um, most people are used to with computers. Um, if you go to, uh, you know, almost everyone has an ATM card, and you can go to any ATM anywhere and withdraw cash, and and they say, well, if you can do it banking, you know, why can't electronic right. records be easy to use? Right. Well, or I don't have any trouble using my computer. I can turn it on and I can write a paper in Word or you know, it's similar enough to other word processing programs that it's, it's really not that difficult. You know, what's, the big, right. what's the big deal? And, and the, the big deal is exactly that workflow um, analysis that you were talking about previously. It's very different. People work very differently uh, to accomplish the same um, set of tasks to uh, to see a patient, to evaluate them, and then to document mm -hmm. the, the, the encounter. Um, some people um, uh, you know, love checklists and can just sit there and easily go through the, the thing. I, I tend to be like that, although not in all cases. Other people can't stand that approach and would rather just much rather have sort of a, a big clean slate to just run through the whole, uh, mm -hmm. whole visit and kind of a uh, a free, more of a free-flowing um, kind of approach. So, so designing an, an effective and useful electronic medical record requires the programmer to understand the way the doctors think, the way they work, and to try to, to mirror that. Um, because with, with any complex process, if you, if you try to change the way the people who are doing it think or work, they're more likely to forget things. They're exactly. more likely to make yeah. mistakes. And, and not only that, um, a medical record for a single doctor is different than a medical record for a large, huge organization of mm -hmm. doctors. So mm -hmm. there's even that difference that somebody who's designing it needs to understand. Yeah. And there are two big promises that we, we've sort of uh, uh, alluded to so far in this discussion. One is that we can look things up on our patients really fast and really mm -hmm. accurately. And that's going to help us improve the quality of our care. It's going to help us with making sure that uh, everyone gets the attention that they need. The other piece is that we can transfer information from one 
care facility to another. Mm -hmm. Right now, uh, there are so on, on paper, there were so many glitches with that sort of system that most of us learned how to take care of patients without receiving information from a transferring physician mm -hmm. because most of the time it wasn't there. Exactly. And, and so th that was such a, a, a glaring deficiency in our healthcare system. And the ability to electronically transfer information from one place to another is, is uh, such an important piece of this of this whole uh, process. Now, Joe, you are involved in electronic health care exchange. Can you tell us what that is and how that fits into this problem? Well, uh, the way mine works is that we are attached to our community hospital and to all of the physician practices in our geographic area. And we actually can remove clinical information from physicians' offices, even if they have different electronic medical records. So we have a vendor who we have hired who provides the platform that is able to take this information and put it all into a single record for each patient. And we actually have about uh, 300,000 patient records so that uh, almost any patient who's living in our geographic area, if they give their consent, we can make their record viewable to all their physicians and to the emergency mm -hmm. department at the hospital, the pre-op area, and mm -hmm. the operating room where sometimes information doesn't show up when mm -hmm. it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a wonderful thing. It's taken us about two years to get it so that it's really working without too many hitches. Mm -hmm. And um, our biggest problem with it is that physicians have to opt in the patients and they don't have time or the energy or anything mm -hmm. else to opt them in. So we're trying to get the state rules to change so that patients can be informed about the health information exchange. And then if they don't want to participate, they could opt out. Right instead of the current practice of opting them in. Which is, is more burdensome. Right. Yes. But, but that is such a critical thing, and I, th I think patients don't necessarily realize the fact that sending the information from one place to another electronically isn't as easy as sending an email. No, uh, right. not at it's, all. With these programs, it's almost as though each brand of program stores the information in a different language. Yes. And so you're, you're sending it to... Different some, language and a different place within the record. Yeah. Yes. And so, you, so there, there are a lot of barriers, and there is a need for standardization. There's a need for convention that allows these programs to talk to each other so that we can, as physicians, do for our patients what they're doing all day in communicating with others. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the ability to do that. I think... We really have enough standards right now to do mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. I think the problem now is that different EMRs uh, have different attitudes about sharing information with other EMRs. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. for some, in some cases, it's very easy to extract clinical information. In other cases, it can be difficult or it can be expensive. Right, it's a, it's a competitive environment. And I exactly. think those barriers are, are coming up at different levels more due to competition than anything else. But there are some areas, like I, I as a patient, know that I can now get into uh, what they call a patient portal, a way for me to, mm -hmm. to get online and talk to my doctor or talk to my mother's doctor, ask for a refill, get lab results, get reminders. Those things are in places in a lot of offices. Yes, um, and it's really very, very helpful. And, and I think this is something that's very important for people to know about and ask about when they see uh, their physician, when they go to a hospital. Um, it, it's, uh, it can be um, confusing and, and um, cumbersome at a time when I'm ill, my loved one is ill, there's a lot of things going on. And then here you're asking me about, do I want electronic access to my record? Um, I think the the answer should always be yes. Mm -hmm. You know, how do I how do I do that? Because it's it's really it's very helpful, for a number of reasons. Um, one is that if uh, you can access it electronically, you can easily. Um, have that data to take it somewhere else to give to another physician. And you can also review the information to make sure that some of the basic things in there are correct. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think this is very important for people to have a look at what the information is. What is uh, 
Um, you know, my physicians, you know, did, did, uh, did we talk about everything that I wanted to? Did we, mm -hmm. did we cover these other issues um, and, and that? And I think these are important, uh, excuse me, these are important ways uh, for people to be able to review their, their own health and participate in their own care. I, I think that in an informed patient who can ask um, questions based on what's going on mm -hmm. um, and facts about things is very important. Um, and, and it's really for their, for their benefit. And there's, yeah. there's another important thing. If you are accessing your information and you see that there's something that's incorrect, you can contact the physician yeah. and tell them that there's a mistake. So this, I think this is important for people to realize because this is a, a component of these electronic records that's available, that's probably underutilized and really isn't advanced. It works mm -hmm. and uh, people can easily use it and it's generally, you know, no cost. Right, correct. So that's a good thing. Well, we've had a good discussion here, I believe, and, and I, I just want to know if you have any final remarks that you'd like to make in the minute we have left. Um, one, one minute. Um, uh, I would just um, say uh, again, I think that it's um, uh, the use of electronic medical records holds a lot of promise. Mm -hmm. There are certainly problems and challenges with them that we need to work on and overcome. But I, um, as with anything else related to a patient's health care, I encourage people to ask questions. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's in the doctor's office, I, I've had patients say to me, um, I, I feel like you're not listening to me because I was yeah. staring at the computer. And yeah. so I, I had to change how you know my my interaction uh, with people so so asking questions about everything in, including okay. what's happening at the time but then also the content of the of the records Dr. Is also well very quickly um, I, I think it's really important for patients to understand that there's a lot of care taken about privacy and confidentiality we really right. didn't get a chance to yes. talk about that issue there's a law called HIPAA yeah. which protects that information. This has been a, a great discussion on electronic records. I believe we've covered a lot of the issues regarding implementation, workflow, standards, information transfer, and the like. Uh, I'd like to thank both of you for being here today for this. And uh, for more information on electronic medical records, visit our homepage at physicianfocus.org. I'm Dr. Dale McGee. Thank you for watching. I'm Dr. Dennis Dimitri. I'm Dr. Monica Burrell. Prescription drugs are valuable medicines and when taken under a doctor's supervision provide effective pain relief for many conditions. But the abuse of these powerful drugs has become a serious public health problem in Massachusetts and across the country, resulting in the needless deaths of thousands of people. If you are prescribed opioids or pain medication, talk with your doctor about the risks and benefits of the medicines and explore different ways to treat your pain. The safe use of prescription drugs comes when physicians and patients work together to promote healing and good health. Medicines cure, heal, and relieve pain. Use them carefully, store them securely, and dispose of them properly when no longer needed. What you do can make a difference. For more information, visit the websites of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health or the Massachusetts Medical Society. I'm Dr. Frank McMillan. And I'm Dr. Raj Devarajan. Colorectal cancer is the second leading cause of cancer-related death in the United States, claiming more than 50,000 lives each year. The cancer occurs in the colon and rectum, parts of the large intestine, and is caused by growths called polyps that can turn into cancer. Screening for colorectal cancer saves lives, but 23 million American adults, about one in three, don't get screened as recommended. Colorectal cancer affects men and women, and the, high, and the risk rises with age and a family history of the disease. If you're over 50 or have a family history of the disease, early screening is recommended. Screening can reduce the risk of colon colorectal cancer by up to 90% by finding and removing the growths before they turn into cancer. For more information on colorectal cancer and the different screening tests available, visit the American College of Gastroenterology.